Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. And I'm Micah. And on today's episode, we will continue our Fantastic Beast character discussions by doing our first revisit of a member of the Core Four. We're talking about Tina this week. Laura could not make it this week, so we did ask the lady, actually, who originally discussed Tina with us back on MuggleCast episode 320, which was back in May 2017, four years ago, Katie. Hi, Katie. Welcome back to the show. Hi. Thanks so much for having me back. I feel like our friendship has grown so much since that episode that it's like a whole other world, and I love you guys so much, so Uh I'm always up for talking to y'all yeah great <laughs> great we love you so we're excited to have you back and it's that's so not all funny oh yeah Go. sorry i was gonna say it's so funny because on that episode 320 we talked about catching the cursed child in new york when it came the following spring and i mentioned it was for my birthday yeah absolutely it's my birthday weekend and we actually ended up all doing that yep oh yeah so, right yeah that worked out super well. fun fun to listen back to that episode and then see what became of things but yeah. yes yeah welcome back Thank you. But Katie is not the only guest we have this week. We're also joined by one of our Slug Club patrons, Deanna. Hi, Deanna. Welcome to the show. Hi. It's I'm nice so to happy have to be here. Good. We're excited to have you here. Uh, let's get your fandom ID since you're new to the show. My favorite book uh, is Deathly Hollows. Favorite movie is uh, Chamber of Secrets. And I thought that was funny when I was answering these questions because I feel like no one ever says Chamber of Secrets. I was going to ask you about it. I was <laughs> actually just going to be like, okay, I'm going to wait till she's done here. But nobody has ever, I yeah. think in the history, answered that. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with movie two, but no. it is long. It kind of drags. And whoa, it's definitely not whoa, people's whoa, favorite. Whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. My Hogwarts house is Gryffindor. I was um, Hufflepuff on um, Potter No More, but I'm not. I'm just not at all a Hufflepuff. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> Shots yeah, fired back gonna, at you, gonna, Eric. Let that roll right off me because that's it. <laughs> morning. I think that I got Puckwudgy, but then it, like it disappeared off the new yeah. Wizarding World website. So mm. I was like, I think it was Puckwudgy, and then I took another quiz just to see, and I got Thunderbird. So favorite Fantastic Beast, the Zowu. Um, yeah, love the Zowu. Um, it just reminds me of a really big kitty. I love it. Um, <laughs> Accurate. And, yeah. Um, and then on here, we had favorite Tina Goldstein quote. Um, and it's definitely like when you can tell that she's really switching sides um, and switching her perspective um, on the beasts in the first movie. And they're like running through the halls. They had escaped like the death potion, her and Newt and like, the swooping evils like going in and out and um she's like what is that thing and newt's like a swooping evil she's like well i love it <laughs> <My favorite line. laughs> whatever it is i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you for those answers welcome to the show again it's great to have you and thanks for your support on patreon and i will observe uh deanna is also wearing a gryffindor sweater today she came prepared i also i have a giant harry potter tattoo but i can't oh. really show it on this Oh, yeah. what is it? Could you describe it's, it? I have the Hogwarts crest. It takes up like my whole thigh. It's like it's like as big as my face. Maybe bigger. Wow. Colored. It's colored, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Does it have all four houses in it? No. Yep. Oh, it does. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the Damn. words. Yep. And it turned out really good. You're happy with it? It is. It's beautiful. My friend from high school did it, and it was his first Harry Potter tattoo he ever did, and he was so excited. Oh. Was he able to finish Hufflepuff? I just wanted he did. to know just based on prior conversation oh, okay yeah. I'm just that was sure. the first one done it was were you were you going uh, no while while he was doing the hufflepuff <laughs> portion <laughs> absolutely you know fun fact about eric eric has a muggle cast tattoo on his shoulder not everybody knows that's that. right yeah. i can show that it's right here there <gasps> we go look at that i love it and to date none of these guys have followed me in that pursuit I don't have tattoos, period. Micah doesn't have tattoos. Laura does have tattoos, including one she regrets. So maybe she could wipe that one out and then yeah, get a muggle that cast over one. With... Yeah. yeah. The mic yeah. Absolutely. Since, since she's not here, I'll tell everybody. She has an iguana tattoo and she doesn't like it. So maybe we can somehow turn the iguana into a mic bolt. Maybe with the tail or something. I don't know. I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> or it would just like a weird hybrid. In the yeah. End. Right. 
We have a couple of quick reminders before we get into our Tina Goldstein discussion. First of all, the MuggleCast 2021 physical gifts are now available for order. You must sign up now before September 1st and pick which gift you want to receive at the Dumbledore's Army level or join us at the Slug Club tier for the choice to select both gifts. As we announced last episode, you can pick from the MuggleCast Retro Socks or a Build Your Own Sweet 16 car. The feedback so far has been very positive. We're, we're very excited to hear that everybody is, is as excited as we are about these gifts. So please, if you are a patron, there's a form available now. You must fill it out in order to receive your gift. So please do that. You have to. You have to before September 1st. Otherwise, we cannot send you one of these items. So there's still and a few weeks left, but don't in delay. In one of the biggest coincidences for me, Katie, who's on the show. Hi, Katie. Her husband, Adam, was the guy who I foremost consulted in the creation of this year's Sweet 16 model wooden car. Oh, He's like okay. this laser printer wood guy, like galore. He's absolutely the nicest gentleman i offered to pay him for all the consulting work he was doing he was telling me what would work what would not work basically helping parse ideas run back and forth and he declined payment and said to donate it to a trans supporting charity instead wow that's amazing that's my man i mean that's adam so definitely check him out at twitter uh over on twitter at dread maker adam for sure. It's I like love that. Dread Pirate Roberts. He's just <laughs> Dread Maker Adam because he's a maker and we both love the Princess Bride. So, yeah. yeah. He helped us make the car, which Katie, you've seen some of a little bit. I have the little prototype. Yeah. The first one that he made. I should have brought it up here to show it on That's the That's okay. Originally, it was much smaller. We'd hate for people to get the wrong idea. We made it bigger. Fair. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to get the bigger one when it comes in. Yeah. yeah. Good and if you're not a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash mugglecast. And if you become a patron within the next month, you will receive one of the gifts. If you fill out the form as well, you'll just get it a couple months later. So again, that's patreon.com slash mugglecast. Thank you, everybody, for your support. All right. So we're talking Tina this week. Eric, why don't you kick things off? Absolutely. So, you know, this was a really exciting thing to do in revisiting characters from the first movie that we've already talked about because we dedicated right in the 320 to 325 episode range was when we were doing our first character discussions for Newt, Tina, Queenie, um, Jacob. We did Credence. We did the other bare bones. And I think the Shaws, I want to say. But so this is the first time now since Crimes of Grindelwald and our initial movie thoughts to actually just get back in to the characters. So the funny thing, and and a couple of us did re-listen to episode 320, but I remember it being um, this episode we were going in and we're like, okay, we have to talk about Tina. There's really not a lot. She's kind of quiet. Like it's, she's like, she's okay. And then slowly throughout the course of discussion on the episode, by the time, like, we kept just making, like, really interesting observations and points. And by the time we were done, we were always like, yeah, actually, Tina's great. Like, <laughs> Tina's, Tina's awesome. Yeah. Like, do, you, do, you, do you have the same memory of this? It, it reminds me of a few weeks ago when I think we were talking about Sprout. Yeah. And I just had such a new appreciation for her after our character discussion. And it's all because we just sat down for an hour and, like, just hashed out what there's to know about these about Sprout or in this case, Tina. Yeah. So I recapped uh, some of our greatest points from that episode, and I was wondering if we could all read them back. So apparently, according to Eric, (laughs) take take my word. I said, I mean, this is a podcast. We're not even playing back the audio. But anyway, I said that Tina (laughs) was meant to be sort of standoffish or hard to like at first so that through the course of the movies, she softens and we end up liking her. And I reminded us that in the era in which Fantastic Beasts was set, women were not expected to be in the workplace. So she is being as reserved and professional as she can be, lest her co-workers think she's weak. But she does have t- trouble towing the line and not letting her passions or obsessions with business and work stuff from getting in the way. That to me was huge um, going into Tina's like character and, and hearing you say that originally, I was like, oh yeah, she can't be sort of more extroverted because she's really not welcome, right? She's kind of considered to be like flunky a little bit. So 
That was really excellent context. I said, uh, I was actually just hung up on the speakeasy scene, the whole discussion. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. When they went into the, uh, I think it was Twisted Pig, when they go into the speakeasy and she says, I've arrested half the people in here. Um, But of course, they're all still there. Like they serve their sentence or whatever. She's just so badass for going into a place where people don't like her and would cause her harm. Right. I thought that Tina would have the most growth overall because of being a more muted character in the first movie. So she starts at a kind of lower position and then she would grow from there. Um, Deanna, how about you? Where were you on Tina after seeing the movie for the first time? Um, I really liked Tina. I actually remember I went back and listened to this episode before recording today, too. And I was like, I remembered that when I was listening to it, I remember being mad at all of you because I was like, (laughs) Tina's awesome. Like, what are they talking about? I love that. Yeah. I really liked her like from the beginning. Um, and like, I think right after I saw the movie, I, um, there was like the memes of like, was it Ron having something on his nose? And then like Newt telling Tina that she's got something on her face and I was like, oh, it's the soulmates thing. And I was like, so into it. And I was like, but she's just like super cool. And like, she's a, a BA. I don't know if I can swear. Um, I you can say, you can say I think I just did. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. I just thought that she was like a very good example of like the strong women characters that J.K. Rowling w- writes. And it was nice to have like a story like even though like the man is the main character, like you still have like these strong women personalities and they're not like your typical women. Um, so I remember being really into her for that reason. So you don't agree at all with Screen Ran and the quote that Andrew read originally, which was that she's bore miney. <laughs> no, I did not like that. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, Screen Ran said that, right? It wasn't me. I just read it. Oh, it was on. I said it wrong. It was honest trailers. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bore Miney. I forgot yeah, about that. It's so, <laughs> so funny. Well, because the interesting thing is, like, for how great, like, how, the, for the for the nice place that we got to at the end of three twenty, Crimes of Grindelwald when it came out, I really don't think does any favors in showing her as like this real like strong person. Because I'll, I'll be clear, I think all of the characters' wills and what they could have had is is kind of in service of just the plot of this whole credence thing that kind of overshadows the rest of the film. So I wanted to ask, because Katie, I know you got some notes and thoughts on this. What kind of are your thoughts on Tina to lead us into kind of crimes of Grindelwald discussion? Well, they're much different this time around with crimes of Grindelwald. Um, I kind of went back to some of the predictions, if you will, of what we said in the first episode on this topic and said, okay, you know, the question was raised, were we right about anything? Were we wrong about anything? And so I picked up a few of those and and put my thoughts in there. We'll see what you guys think as well. Um, so regarding Micah's idea that her standoffishness would soften over time and we would become more likely to like her. Um, In Crimes of Grindelwald, not so much. Her walls have flown right back up to where they were at the beginning of the first movie due to Queenie's re-entanglement with Jacob, due to Newt's supposed engagement uh, to or with Lita. Um, So we get like a short glance of the Tina we love in the French Ministry of Magic scene when she like finds Theseus and Newt's all happy about it. And then Newt explains the magazine mix up uh, where he's like, I want you to be happy, but not about that and et cetera. So we just we don't get much warm, fuzzy Tina in this one either. And I was just like, oh, come on. I was waiting (laughs) for that. Like we saw it at the end of the first movie. Like she was hopping the skipping off in the distance after her little encounter with him um during the not kiss during the not kiss yeah precisely and i was just like oh yeah i agree with that you do get it a little bit when tina and nude have their moment in the ministry though so there's that at least i just like i still struggle with the movie as a whole oh okay i don't think that it's like entirely on the characters i think that there was like it's the whole it's the whole thing that didn't like Mm go together well enough um but i did i i like again felt like 
oh, like she's very career oriented here and she's very like passionate about like what she's about. Like she's trying to protect like this kid. Mm. I, I was thinking, I was reading through some of the notes and I was like, when she, she's so standoffish towards Newt and it's like, oh, well, if you thought this guy was into you and then you see he's engaged to an ex-girlfriend, like, haven't we all sort of like had that experience where, and then we're really upset and we don't want to talk to that person. And they're like, but what's wrong? Yeah. And like, and we've all had that experience where it's like, mm, no, I'm not, I'm not really into you anymore. Like I'm upset and I don't want to talk to you. Um, so I thought that I felt like that was relatable versus like her standoffishness is back up. It's like, I, I like we've all been there with the unrequited thing. And then you're upset because you thought it was requited. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I'll say is we do have five movies to soften her up a bit, right? Like, this is only the do second we? one. Yeah. Do, we, do we? Do we have five movies now? I'm with, I'm with Eric. <laughs> Supposedly, She's going to be really super soft in the next one. August just in case. 2021, we still have five movies. But I, yeah. I agree, though. But she was introduced that way. If you go all the way back to the beginning of Fantastic Beasts, she was very kind of standoffish and career oriented, right? She does. She captures the one person in Newt that you know we were just introduced to, and we're kind of looking forward to seeing what it is that he's all about. And then she's like, "Oh, but I'm going to arrest you and take you to Makusa." And you know, I think that sours the taste right away for a lot of people. Mm. Doesn't her standoffishness kind of come with the territory of being an aura, though? Like she's a cop. That's kind of, I think, just how <laughs> how she'll be. And I know we're talking about in in more personal scenes as well, but you combine yeah. the aura role with the drama that's going on with Queenie and Newt. She's just got a lot going on right now, and there's not too many reasons for her to be particularly happy and soft as we're using. Yeah, you know. yeah, well... And like Katie mentioned, we all agree, like the ministry scene, you know, when she's able to throw a little shade and she gets a little in return, when the woman's asking her name and she says Leader Lestrange and and, he's, and she says his fiance, you know, which showcase, she says it like tongue in cheek and real snarky like that. And he's like, oh, I'm in trouble here. There's been a misunderstanding. That's fun. That's actually a genuinely fun moment. But I, I think for me, where it falls a little short in terms of the writing is that the misunderstanding happened off screen. You know, these two movies in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them and Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald have the shortest duration between them that ever known to man. We thought because of the massive 15 years that this whole series should be covering leading up to 1945 and it's 1927, that there would be a few year time jump between the first and second film. It's been three months. And yet in that three months. Somehow the entire world has learned about the existence of Credence and cares about his daily movements where he last ate. Everybody's tracking Credence. And Tina has had this huge blowout where she saw something in the paper and did, like believed that Newt was getting married, didn't confirm with him, didn't consult Queenie about it, and is just angry and then has taken up relations with this other or named, what is it, Toddington or Tuttup? Top. Tolliver. Tolliver. And I'm just like, that's way too fast in the span of three months. Like if I ever had a breakup like that or was into somebody and I found that they were dating somebody else, six months I'd be out feeling sorry for myself. It's called um, a rebound, <laughs> Eric. Some of us need it. Oh, uh, well, maybe that's actually to Tina's credit then. She immediately is just like, well, enough of that nonsense. I can date an or. I don't need to date this <laughs> right. kind of half emotionally available uh, briefcase boy. I can just, you know. <laughs> briefcase boy. Go for this desk clerk or whatever. That's a new thing. one. I haven't heard yeah. of that before. The guy who says my eyes look like salamanders. <laughs> I know. Barf, right? The Barf. bar is low. <laughs> uh, so actually, maybe that's to Tina's credit then. But I just think a lot of this whole conflict thing it happened off screen and so it feels well, manufactured for plot right that it's like and here's the other thing about tina in this film she appears last of the rest of the core four she's she's introduced well after newt jacob queenie who i understand they have a scene together but she's introduced at about the 30 minute mark in even into the film it's not when she's interacting with other characters she's still alone but we don't even see her till a quarter of the movie is over and then it's not until an hour and 30, a full hour later, that we actually get 
sort of the resolution that should have come right away where she asks Newt what's up with his fiance and he's able to tell her. And that's most the way through the movie. The only scene after that is like the final breakdown. So they basically spend the whole film in this funk. And that's not great from a character loving standpoint to have our characters, especially the part of the core four, be at a misunderstanding for the most film when they could have just talked it out. You're not wrong. Yates. Yeah, well, <laughs> and many others. So it's interesting to do a Tina discussion because I do think that her character might have suffered the most from this particular plot being forced on her. There, there's still something there with Credence, though. You know, she's the person who first defended Credence. The reason she lost her order status in the first film is because she attacked Mary Lou Barebones for attacking Credence. And, you know, she stood up to him. So you would think that the two of them would even get a reunion. But although she follows mm. him to the circus in Crimes of Grindelwald, they don't even, I don't think, make eye contact. And there's no meaningful interaction now that Tina has tracked. Like, if Tina cares so much about Credence that she, too, is bringing herself to Paris, Credence is none the wiser for it. And that would have been more meaningful if he had known that somebody from New York was searching for him. Agreed. So while we get back to Katie's breakdown here of, of what sure. we were predicting... So, Andrew, I believe you thought she was going to get her mojo back. And she did, um, even with, you know, no longer speaking to her sister at this point and the news telling her that her love interest or expected love interest is marrying another. Tina is a queen. Like, look at that coat. Look at that haircut. <laughs> she and she's like the first one to find credence. Like maybe Grindelwald knew where he was first. But she came all the way from America. Like, Grindelwald was already in Europe. He didn't have far to go. She figured out where he was and tracked him down to that circus. And it was only circumstance that kept her from meeting up with him that night because that just happened to be the night that he and Nagini decided to get out of there. Although that was orchestrated by Grindelwald, now that I think about it, because he gave him the note. Oh, um, right. Or he gave it to somebody else to give to him. No, but the point still um, stands. Like, she tracked him totally yeah. of her own... The fact that they didn't meet doesn't speak to her failings. Right. Yeah. She did everything right. Um, but she did make some rookie mistakes. Um, I reached out to a couple of friends of my, or a couple of my Speak Beastie friends, uh, which is a, a Fantastic Beasts um, podcast all on its own. They just talk about Fantastic Beasts and they've been on a hiatus, but happy to say they are back as of this Sunday. So if y'all haven't checked them out before, please do. Um, but Sophie Buchan, I hope I said that right, uh, says, I do not like how Tina was so right in movie one and no one listened. But in movie two, her instincts are off when she just goes with comma. Like, girl, you are right. Is your sus meter broken now? <laughs> sus -meter. <laughs> I'm reading. I'm reading her quote. Uh, yes, her sus meter. So she just follows this guy blindly without even questioning. And I'm like, you're an horror. You should know to not just follow a random guy into some random alley underneath the street. Yeah, I guess she just got let her excitement get the better of her. And she's like, oh, good. Somebody who has some info information. Great. Let me go. But yeah, you're right. There yeah. should have been a, a lot more caution when meeting a stranger. Stranger danger. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit of stranger danger. But she does at least start out with her mojo back and i was i was thrilled to see that confidence i do i i did submit this pr on a previous episode i feel like i do have to bring it up again here because katie you mentioned the hair i have an aunt who i do not like who has basically a very similar haircut oh, and and when no. i th when i look at tina i think of my aunt my aunt is the reason for a lot of family drama even oh, no. now. So I look at her and I just think it's my aunt. And and so for that reason, I really do not like the haircut. The truth comes out. <laughs> oh, all these biases are like, man, Andrew really hates Tina. All these years, it's just been the hair. It's been the hair. It reminds me of my aunt. Sorry. That's fair. Hopefully she has a nice new haircut when she's in Brazil. Oh, yeah. I would love she that. She grows it out longer. I should write to Warner Brothers. Dear Warner Brothers, her haircut is bothering me. Whatever, dude. <laughs> it's too late. They already filmed the film, apparently. <laughs> reshoots. So... <laughs> I demand reshoots. Can we digitally lengthen Tina's hair for your sake? <laughs> WB removed Henry Cavill's mustache 
in oh. Justice League, right? Was it Justice League? So they could do something similar here, I'm sure. It went over really <laughs> badly, but they can try again. <laughs> yeah. Digital wig, CGI, he'll be fine. So yeah, they yeah. captured not the greatest moment for Tina in Crimes of Grindelwald. Nope. Not 30 minutes in, not not a good look. Um, so I also asked my friend Jeffrey Hutton, who is also part of Speak BC. Uh, he says, is it, it is a known fact that the coat she was given to wear for the second film was very heavy. You can see something of that in her face, I think. Like she's carrying a literal and metaphorical weight on her shoulders. I have a sneaking suspicion that Colleen Atwood did that on purpose to enhance the ever-increasing amount of responsibility that Tina is taking on by becoming part of this group of rebels who are secretly saving the world. I like that. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And then I like looked up quotes about the coats and yeah she has talked about this in interviews not necessarily saying she made it heavy on purpose but she has said that it is heavy um i got a few quotes here one from the nocturne uh she says tina has this rocking leather coat that speaks for itself i think we meet tina where she comes into the movie and she has been reinstated and she has power now i think the coat sort of conveys that well on Catherine waterston Uh, From GQ magazine in Britain. I also love the leather coats I designed for the film for Catherine and for the Aurors. I just love those kind of pre-war huge leather coats. They're just so beautiful to me, even though they weigh 500 pounds. (laughs) (laughs) She was exaggerating. Or maybe that was like all of them together weighed 500 pounds. Not sure. Probably not just one. I think those actors would be crushed. (laughs) This is Oscar (laughs) winner Colleen Atwood, by the way, the one who won the Harry Potter film franchise. It's first and only so far Oscar. The costume designer. Yeah, she's the costume designer. And one more from Vulture.com. Moviegoers will also be dazzled by Porpentina Goldstein's striking blue leather trench coat. Atwood described the thinking behind that look. We wanted to give Catherine's costume a sense of authority. That coat is a big presence. It's dramatic. Dramatic. It has an amazing silhouette from far away, Atwood explained. It's like armor. It's a protective thing. She's still vulnerable, even though she has power and has risen to a world of strength. It still conveys that underneath there are other things going on. I really liked that one because that has a lot of layers to it. That's a good example of visual storytelling, right? Like you wouldn't pull that substantially you wouldn't pull it out of the film until you like looked at it and you're like oh it's probably affecting me subconsciously and this is why films yeah. have costume designers so they can think this <laughs> deeply about what an actor is wearing i don't know why but it's reminding me of like in all of the game of thrones seasons like daenerys's outfits change based on like the level of power that she's accumulating and like uh... what season they're in and whatever and like cersei's armor like her armor um dresses yeah this also reminds me of umbridge's pink dresses in order of the phoenix i believe they get a darker pink as the film progresses Um. yeah that's something you might not ever notice until you read that interview with the costume designer and then you can't not see it yeah (laughs) it's great Uh, And then going away from her costume, although I am really interested now to see what her costume is going to be in the next film. Like, will it be more armor like or less? Eh, And her hair will be the same. Will it be more like my aunt's or less? That's what I'm wondering. (laughs) I really want a side by side picture now. (laughs) What happens when your aunt gets a haircut? What happens when your aunt hears this episode? That's (laughs) that's what I'm concerned about. Then then the family drama will definitely continue for decades into the future. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, when when you go home, your mom's going to be like, oh, let's listen to the most recent episode of MuggleCast, Andrew, with everybody gathered around the... uh... That's part of the problem, Micah and dear listeners. This aunt doesn't want to interact with my immediate family anymore but this is a discussion for another time and another podcast so let's let's (laughs) moving on (laughs) um but yeah so my first impressions uh i just wanted to throw this in there for all of us to to discuss um but i'm gonna quote my buddy jeffrey again first because he had a really just i loved how he put it and i very much agreed with what he had to say um first impressions this is Jeffrey's quote. Um, when I saw Crimes of Grindelwald, Tina, how come we get so much direct insight into how Newt's situation has affected their relationship, but not her? We hear about what's happened with Newt, Theseus, and Lita. Then we spend a bunch of time with Newt, but we don't really see Tina struggle with her relationship with Newt until he shows up and she cold shoulders him. 
I think that makes a lot of the audience sort of biased towards Newt and unfairly hard on Tina. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't like that she didn't get she didn't get enough screen screen time. Um, My I put it in my own words that Tina got shafted in this film, in my opinion. I think it's uh, it's just another problem with the writing is there's too many characters. There's way too many characters. And you're like, how do I keep up with all of this? And there's not enough time to put all of them in and give all of them adequate attention. My hope is that with the next one, two or three movies, they really streamline the number of characters. They reduce the number of characters in the movie to give each of these characters more time, the core four more time Mm -hmm. than the other important ones. I I think that's one of the, the issues too, of not having a source material, right? Where, you come into the Potter series as book readers, you have an established sense of who these characters are before you ever even see them on screen. Whereas with, let's just call them the core four of the Fantastic Beasts series, you need to actually spend time developing them as characters. And they did that, I think, pretty well in the first film, but then you go into the second film and it's like, okay, well now we're going to introduce Dumbledore and we're going to throw in Yusuf Kama and we're going to throw in all these other characters that, to Andrew's point, like, there's too many too soon. Right. And, and and there's valuable screen time spent on telling us what their deal is. When, instead of kind of letting the characters show us like the characters that were pre-existing kind of stumble on things. Yeah. To respond to Jeffrey and Katie's point, I Newt is the lead character. So maybe that's why, you know, yeah. that I that's at Fair. least part of why but we're getting more of it from Newt's angle. She's the love interest. Yeah. Like, yeah. And like, it's not a romance movie, but like, it, it's like Star Wars, like an old Western kind of theme in the background where like, sometimes like the romantic subplot can really like get you more tied into the film. And it's like, you don't have this other person's perspective. And then you're like, okay, I don't really know what's going on with this person. How can I feel connected to to this like romantic subplot, which does drive a lot of like connection with film. That's fair. Yeah. So is it that beca- like Tina and Newt are both outsiders to their credit and, and in their own way, too, mm-hmm. but they shouldn't be an outsider to the film audience, I don't think. Like the film should be showing us what's going on in their head. Yeah, I feel like we got more of the love interest angle with Queenie and Jacob than we did with Newt and Tina. Well, and that takes a hard turn. It's absolutely yeah. every character plot thing that's happened in between the three month period between two films is in my mind overshadowed by Queenie and Jacob and the decision to make Queenie brainwash Jacob slash rape slash Mm -hmm. who knows what else. And that's huge. And I can't wait to be scared about talking about that on this show (laughs) um, for those character discussion episodes. But it's just a bold, it's a huge choice to have one of the core four be pulled against his will by the other member of the core four all the way to Paris um and get London their scene type. together and i just feel like with that once that's in the plot of the film you can't unmake that and then this tina stuff just seems like well obviously they're not going to get to her there's all this other stuff that's happening so it just seems like it with the choice of doing that in the plot really kind of makes tina the least prominent in in just more ways than one and i wonder mm-hmm. if like there's some deleted scenes or like scenes that were written in that ultimately like didn't end up being filmed that were more details on her, but it didn't like go with the flow of the movie and that. And so they were removed. Well, didn't we see the bookshop where Newt was having his, um, like, Oh yeah. Public, like, his release party. Yeah. That release party was like a scene shot, right? Now, Cause it only appears as a photograph in the final film. Yes. But yeah, I think that whole thing where like it became the misunderstanding that was the misprint might have been in an early version yeah. of the film. That's right, because yeah. it was Theseus and Lita at the book release party or book signing, whatever. And so yeah. that's why, like you're saying, Eric, it was printed in the paper that Newt and Lita were a pair. The well, newspaper here's got the interesting wrong. thing, because yeah, because if you don't see that photo, fo- if you don't really notice that photograph when you're watching crimes of grindelwald you also don't really know that fantastic beasts and where to find them the book that harry potter later has in school has been published now Mm -hmm. yeah that would have been a really good tie-in 
Yeah, like <laughs> even just showing his book release party, like he's now the only line I heard when I rewatched Crimes of Grindelwald was the guy they get the port key from says uh, world famous Newt's commander. So like, but again, it's only been three months. So all of a sudden yeah. his book is like the world's biggest global like sensation that he has to up the price of getting him out of the country. It's just so much happened in that three month period. It's just unbelievable. And also Agreed. what I never, that's a really good point. I never understood why Tina wouldn't come to Newt's book release party. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't they talk specifically about that in the last, or he says he'll send her a copy. No, he says he's going to deliver in person. Deliver, oh, would she okay. like that? Yeah, but she and wouldn't like stay away. literally got a tear going down her cheek as she says, yes, I would like that very much. But she, <laughs> but, like, but she, Mike is right, though. She wouldn't stay away from a book release party. She could see in person that Newt wasn't going to be engaged to somebody. Yeah, maybe she was busy on a mission. Oh, yeah. That with time. Um, ministry. Maybe the book really, he couldn't get her the book until after the book release because he's like, goofy and like didn't want to ask for a book ahead of time and then the, she stopped responding to his correspondence or something and then he was like well do i actually go and give it to her and then he never did and then she was dating someone else and yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i can buy that i could see that so it, by the way i just want to make a quick correction it's in a magazine not a newspaper okay. right 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 for those out there screaming at us. it had to be a tabloid <laughs> They just print whatever they want. Lots more to talk about concerning Tina today. But first, this week's episode is sponsored by Quip, makers of all kinds of excellent products that keep your mouth clean and healthy. Let's talk about mouthwash for a minute. I've told you about Quip's toothbrushes, gum, and floss, and they recently launched a new mouthwash to help you complete your clean. Plus, it comes with a refillable dispenser that's delightful to use and sleek enough to fit on any bathroom counter. Mouthwash hasn't changed in 140 years, but Quip's has. Their alcohol-free 4X concentrated mouthwash comes in a beautiful, eco-friendly refill bottle that's 100% recyclable. It's their way of helping make your mouth a little cleaner and the earth a little greener. Quip mouthwash kills bad breath germs, helps prevent cavities, and leaves you feeling fresh. Their 4X concentrate has fluoride and xylitol, and they left out the artificial colors and stinging alcohol you'll find in other rinses. Quip's refillable mouthwash is good for your mouth and the planet. With that 4X concentrated formula, Quip ships less water and more good-for-you ingredients. I can't brush my teeth without also using mouthwash. The toothbrushing and mouthwash combo is the only way I can feel like my mouth is clean. And I find all of Quip's products incredibly innovative. So I was super excited to try out this mouthwash and it did not disappoint. And if you go to getquip.com slash muggle5 right now, you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-dose supply of Quip's 4X concentrated formula at getquip.com slash muggle5, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash muggle5. Quip is the good habits company. So in the absence of too many Tina moments to really talk about in the film, I did think we could always rely on our brand new character discussion thing on MuggleCast, which is the horoscope. Yeah. So let's see if we can discern any meaning of Tina's actions from going through the character horoscope. To recap, we did talk about her name origin last time. And Katie, you really went into the weeds on that. Porpentina which is her first name, is a dated word for porcupine, which explains her prickly nature. Esther can mean star. And also there was this story about it meaning one who searches for evil. So the fact that she was uh, an auror for Macusa was really, really, really cool. But we did not do her horoscope. Micah, would you like to take that? Yeah. So uh, Tina was born on August the 19th. Uh, just two days after me, but many years before, uh, back in 1901, <laughs> 1901. <laughs> which places her on the Leo and Virgo cusp. So people born on August 19th have a burning ambition to succeed in their endeavors. Once you've put your mind to something, you never stop until you have achieved it. August 19th Zodiac people are on the Leo Virgo cusp, as mentioned. We refer to this as the cusp of exposure. The cusp of exposure has given you monumental power. You can do far much more than other zodiacs. You're in control of most aspects of your life. Also, you have a palpable influence over the goings on in your community. 
The fact that you're inquisitive and observant is an added bonus in your life. You can easily analyze what is happening in your society. This means that you're at the forefront creating solutions to the problems that bedevil your community. You have good plans for your family. You try and engage them in activities that will bring positive change in each of their lives. Wow, pretty spot on for what we've seen of Tina so far and could be a little bit of foreshadowing to what is to come for her in this series. Yeah. I mean, in terms of creating solutions, I look forward to seeing her come up with the thing that's going to get Queenie back to the side of the good for Jacob and for Newt. Yeah. I thought this was just on the nose. I was like, whoa, this is just as spot on as her name meaning was. (laughs) Like, did J.K. Rowling look this up too? Of course she did. (laughs) Yeah, definitely the um, putting your mind to something you never stop until you've achieved it. I mean, you could probably look at that on a number of different levels, but I think of just given what happened to her after attacking Mary Lou Barebone, the fact that she is unwilling to just kind of settle and and not try and get back her position as an aura. Um, she doesn't kind of let that slow her down at all. And of course she ends up getting her aura ship, if if that's a word, back at mm, uh yeah. the end of the first movie. Or you could look at it as saying maybe she's uh after Newt and she's not gonna stop till she gets it. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> you forgot to read this line about these types of people loving hot dogs. <laughs> yeah, just mustard. Just mustard. Yeah. <laughs> and I I noticed in the last episode on Tina, I mentioned her biblical counterpart and how she saved the Jewish people from being slaughtered by revealing her own Jewish ancestry to the king who she was married to. And instead, they executed the guy who came up with the idea to slaughter the Jews instead. And It just didn't occur to me that, oh, right. We were like talking about how Tina is Jewish and we're going into World War II. Like maybe she's going to help save some Jewish people from the Nazis Mm. later on. I don't know. Wow. I was just listening back. I was like, how did I not pick up on that when I was, it was literally coming out of my mouth. (laughs) I just... (laughs) I was reading it out and not thinking, I think, at the time. That's just so interesting because in addition to every plot that's been thrown into the wizarding component, to think that the core four would have anything to do with the muggle side of World War II is very, it's titillating, but it's just like, how are they possibly going to fit that into the movie as well? Like, are they going to cast Hitler? Like, who's, what's going to, and then is Grindelwald going to be his, like, buddy? But, you know, I think- if nothing else, like seeing Grindelwald's vision in the second movie, World War II is going to serve as a backdrop to these next couple of films. I mean, they showed like the tanks and the soldiers and the atom bomb being dropped. So I think they're, they're it seems like they're weaving it into the story. I don't think it's going to kind of like come necessarily right to the forefront, but. Right. Maybe they'll continue to make symbolic references, but it's never going to come to like very more explicit references and like you know rip from the headlines type stuff yeah i don't think i don't know um because like in deathly hollows like there was a bunch of accidents that were wizarding caused that were blamed on like freak tornado or like the bridge collapse and stuff like that so maybe there will be like little things like that dropped in right yeah there's no coincidence that Grindelwald's defeated in 1945, and that's the year that World War II comes to an end. Mm-hmm. It suggests, I think, correlation, if not direct causality. Yeah. Like that he's behind both wars, basically, <laughs> Wizarding and Muggle is what it seems like. So, anyway, getting back to Tina, a couple more questions about sort of her choices or lack thereof in the film. Like, I think that she actively, upon receiving the news of Newt's engagement, what she thinks is Newt's engagement, she doesn't reach out to him at all to clarify. She kind of just, you know, puts her head down. Does that come from some insecurity, do we think, maybe? Because I also don't really read her as insecure. I think she's very secure in her feeling like she is going to pursue something till the end. And even when she's no longer an aura, she has enough of a drive within herself to still do the work anyway. She's stubborn. So I don't think she'd be the kind of person who would just 
hang her head down and not reach out to Newt going, hey, what the yeah. heck? The, you know, a letter would have been nice. But remember, are you alone, Tina? Yes, Miss Esposito, <laughs> always alone. <laughs> so this might have been like her first foray into feelings for someone. And then she gets her heart just broken within a month or two. And like it's, it's super obvious at the end that they are both into each other. There's no question, even if there's not an actual kiss. At the end of movie and one. Then, right. Sorry. Yeah. The end of movie one. And then she thinks that he just forgot about her and went and got engaged to Lita, you know, the one that we holds the picture of in his case. Right. Um, I can understand. I Yeah, I can understand those feelings that she may have had. Yeah. Um, I don't think. And I think there is an indication of insecurity when like, when like she's, he's leaving and she's like, does Lita like, does Lita Lestrange like to read? She asks about her. She is uh, like right there worried about her. And like, I've seen like having a lot of friendships with other women. Like if you have a sister who is like Queenie, who is like, and she's, she says in the movie, like, oh, you're, you're not the only guy who's like thought something like that when they first see me. And she like, she's very like attractive and out there and like, and then you have the other sister who's like, oh, I don't feel that confident. And like being like juxtaposed with that can sometimes like it just plays tricks on your mind. And I could see her being a little like less confident and second guessing herself and being like, of course, he went back to that girl he uh, dated in high school. Well, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for clarifying that. And then also speaking of Queenie, though, shouldn't she have stepped in? Uh, Queenie's dealing with her own stuff with Jacob. She's made a very hard decision that Tina does not approve of. And gee, why not? Um, but I feel like this whole like Queenie directly addresses Lita with Newt and has and reads his mind even when he asks her not to. So I feel like Queenie knows the Lita situation pretty well from that scene. And if Tina and Queenie had been speaking, Queenie would have definitely said there's got to be something off about this like i told mm. newt he needed a, a a giver not a taker and it seems un you should reach out to him because i think this must be a mistake kind of a thing there just would have been some kind of conversation not an hour and a half into the new movie yes yeah. but if like if tina's already like saying that thinking that queenie doesn't have proper judgment she's just not gonna yes. listen to her and that's the problem with not knowing like how the timeline between these movies happened um, because it's like, would that conversation have happened between sisters or were they already not talking yeah. or like what is happening at all here? It's, in Harry Potter discussions, we talk about the missing 24 hours, but I really want to read the missing three months, <laughs> um, how things happen. Maybe I'll write it. After well, I good news. There's going to be additional script books that follow <laughs> the events in between script books right. one and two. Just give us real books. I was going to say, The Eric, second and a half story. You are very uh, much um, the someone one who half. likes to write the missing three months of romance. So I think that this yeah. is a great follow-up to Harry and Ginny for you. I appreciate how much credit I'm getting for a story I haven't touched in a couple of years, but I'm back to it uh, this year. I promise it's going to be done. But, um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, no, moving on the, it is fun to see Tina and Newt interact though. Like the yeah. best, because Newt, like he, he knows she's mad at him and he also doesn't know what he did to cause it. And so he kind of is just like, well, I'm still going to be myself, right? He doesn't, he's not put out by the fact he's not especially put out by the fact that they're not getting along. And so when they first, you know, see each other and it's when Yusuf Kama has trapped Jacob and Newt in the basement as well, but then collapsed uh, Tina says to him, this was a rescue attempt. You lost me my only lead. And he says, and how was the interrogation going before we turned up? Because she's been imprisoned. And I, I love that line. I love that banter. I love these two. Yeah. yeah. But then there's this whole, that whole middlehead thing when they're running, like at least there you do get, although it's like a walk and talk, it feels like, um, Aaron Sorkin wrote that part of the movie, but like the, the entire discussion where she says that you think that orders are like bureaucrats and you you like called them hyped up desk people or whatever it was. And Newt's like, yeah, but 
you've got a middlehead. You're not like them. And then she's like, what? And it gives him the opportunity to use that term that no one else uses. And it's beasts related. And it is adorable. Like I ship those two for sure. But we see how well they work together when they're getting along. And then you wonder why they were ever not getting along in the first place. I think Mm -hmm. Newt has a difficult time communicating his feelings. Oh, he definitely does. I mean, if you rewatch that scene with the eyes and the salamander, it's like it's taken him forever <laughs> to get things off his chest. It's like, come on already. I got to record Michael cast. Let's get through this scene but, so I can go. Jacob <laughs> told him he's not supposed to. See, he was following his good buddy Jacob's advice to well, take I, forever. To, I agree yeah. with good buddy Jacob. It's not the best thing to say to somebody, especially if you've been on the rocks, I think. I don't, maybe some, maybe Tina finds it romantic. Maybe. I think she does. Do she we, what's got the, it. What's she the barometer did. on that? Yeah, okay. All right, show of hands. Oh, yeah. Did anybody here, would, would anybody like have their heart melt if they heard that? Well, what he says is like her eyes it, reflect fire and water in a really interesting way. And I think that's cool as that's hell. Nice. So I'm going yeah, yeah, to put my, yeah. my hand. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, for that. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but the salamander yeah, Salamander eyes. Well, that's that's the thing. The way he says it to Jacob earlier in the film wouldn't work with to Tina. Right. That would just be yes. awful. Her eyes remind me of a cell or something like that. But the way yeah. he explains it in the ministry actually does make sense in track. And she's read his book by that point. So she gets all of that. I like it. I, I, do, I do like the fact that he goes to Jacob for dating advice, too. I think that's kind of comical. Yeah, Jacob, who's been put under a spell for several months, and before that, we don't know what his relationship was like. Although, I do remember in the extended canon, he was married in an original... He was engaged. engaged. Oh, engaged. Oh, yeah. And she left him after he came back from the bank, so he got like denied from the loan, and then she was like, bye. Yeah, wow. that was mean. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Real mean. So, But it's funny that their their bromance is enjoyable in this film. Definitely. Yeah. I, I won't even say bromance because that like trivializes it. Their relationship and uh, trust on one another, I think is really yeah. solid. Yeah. Brother from another mother. <laughs> yeah. That, that kind of thing. There you go. Which yeah. it's interesting when we get into Newt's brother later, but he doesn't have any scenes <laughs> with Tina. Yeah. But like Jacob's like a brother that like actually accepts him for who he is versus like Theseus being like, why can't you be more like me? (sighs) Right. But it's okay because at the end of the film, after Lita has died, Newt is like, I've chosen a side and it's with you. But and and I mean, it cuts both ways. Like Newt accepts Jacob for and and he's a muggle, you know, but still loves him dearly. But anyway, back to Tina. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we've pretty much covered the majority of the other scenes with Tina in them. And we've also done good work talking about, you know, in my opinion, talking about kind of the, like, various contrivances of the plot that may have reduced Tina from getting a shining moment necessarily. So I'd like to switch games, uh, switch gears and talk about what lies ahead. Um, Because we do have maybe three films left with Tina. So let's do what we did the first time and predict where we will see her character go. And for this, uh, Micah, do you want to take the the charge here? Yeah, sure. So these were just a couple of questions that came to mind when I was thinking about what lies ahead for, for Tina. And the biggest question I think for me is what is her relationship going to be like with her sister now that Queenie has supposedly sided with Grindelwald are we headed toward a showdown between sisters in future movies? I think definitely. And I wouldn't be surprised if we got like flashbacks to their youth, like maybe Mm -hmm. even with their parents involved, but for, we wouldn't normally have to do flashbacks and I hate relying on them, but because we only met the Goldstein sisters when they were adults, there might be something important from their, even adolescence that comes into play that, Tina is able to use to get Queenie back um, yeah, or make her see some reason. Do we think that um, Tina knows occlumency or will learn occlumency? Hmm. That's really interesting because having such a hot, a huge legitimate sister, would she ever have closed herself off or would she have just trusted Queenie to not read her mind? Yeah. Cause it seems like their relationship is that like, Tina's just used to it and she just lets it happen and she doesn't try to stop it at all. But if she's like, if it's not working out and um, like Tina could be like Queenie could be getting information from Tina, like would Tina realize that she needs to learn occlumency in some capacity? 
That's a really good question. Yeah. How much time is like passing in almost... between movies two and three? Because that is probably going to take a lot of time for her to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, as an auror, you would think that would be almost a re- prerequisite for that position. Like you have to at least be somewhat accomplished at it. Maybe not a master like Snape or anything, but yeah, I was really disappointed that she didn't try to save Queenie there at the end. Like all she does is scream her name, <clears throat> excuse me, scream her name as she's disapparating after she's already chosen to go with Wizard Hitler. <laughs> like little late. Like Newt's over here, Accio and the Niffler. She couldn't go Accio sister, Accio <laughs> Queenie. Like get that. Imagine the privacy her- issues there, though, Katie. Being able to Akio a hum- a wizard. <laughs> They're in the same room. <laughs> like far. Oh my god. Oh, but at least scream before she walks into the fire. Or just like let her know she's there and she cares. Yeah. Uh, I don't even think she knew she was in the room. It's for some reason I can't picture Tina being the one directly responsible for saving Queenie. I just have a feeling it's going to go a different way. I just feel like Queenie is so deeply gone. On one hand, maybe it could only take a family member to get uh, get her back. But on the other hand, I think this is going to be some sort of team effort or uh, she's going to be woken out of the spell that Grindelwald has her under, the, the tea that Grindelwald has her under. Um, I don't know. I just I think it's I think it's going to be a lot more than just Tina saving queenie i just hope it doesn't involve jacob dying that would make me really sad yeah that's been a theory i've had that jacob i feel like he has to die because he's the muggle so it's just gonna be so sad that we lose the muggle friend you know you know what he's he's on the bridge to hogwarts and it doesn't look like anything so he might fall to his death and die (laughs) like that's where we last left him maybe the ex-fiance will become the new core four member after jacob dies (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I can't really see a showdown between them. Like, I can't see them dueling or anything like that. Mm. Can you? Maybe. Like, if anybody can duel Queenie, it's probably Tina, because again, the mind reading thing, like she'd be able to predict their spells and stuff. But I think with with Tina, she would still respect the rules, maybe, and and be like, her habit is not to get into Tina's head. So I think she wouldn't be very good at navigating it if she did. Yeah, I mean, and just simply knowing somebody for so long, you probably know their dueling style and their the spells that they excel at. So you would think it would just be that simple, too. I, I could potentially defeat her because I know how she fights best. Not like she gets in a lot of duels, but y- yeah. you know what she likes. You know, you know her her moves. Yeah. And now I'm stuck in the occlumency thing where it's like maybe Tina learns occlumency and she shuts out her sister. And then at the end, they're like fighting and then Tina lets her back in and Queenie realizes how much she loves her. And it's Aww. all J.K. Rowling's like power of love thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. I love it. I want that to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> Head pre canon. <laughs> One other question, I think, Katie, this ties into what you were talking about earlier, uh, knowing that World War II is serving as a backdrop for this Fantastic Beast series, or at least part of it. Um, how concerned should we be for the Goldstein family? It's worth mentioning the close resemblance between the names of of Nurmengard uh, and Nuremberg. And, you know, Nur- Nurmengard is where you know, we're taken to at the end of the crimes of Grindelwald. It's really kind of his, you know, hideout. Um, but it's also where he ends up being imprisoned in the future. And, um, you know, the Nuremberg trials were the trials that were conducted against those that committed crimes um, against the Jewish people and others during World War II. Um, so it's it's not Again, just a coincidence that Grindelwald would end up in a place with a similar name, assuming he was also himself convicted and then imprisoned uh, for his crimes against the larger wizarding community and probably the Muggle community um, in these films. So, but I'm concerned, you know, Tina Goldstein, Queenie Goldstein, um, that they could also become, you know, imprisoned at some point. Yeah, I mean, it It really depends if Queenie's loyalties will be questioned by Grindelwald. You know, she 
right now has seemingly penetrated his inner circle and he's pretty confident that he can control her and trust her because he's promised her a world in which her love for her muggle, you know, boyfriend can can continue, you know, un like well, be tolerated. So he feels he could control her, but if that switches, if she does anything, if she screws up, he could actually literally imprison her and then Tina could do like a rescue attempt and also end up herself imprisoned. I just had a thought too about something that happens in Crimes of Grindelwald and it relates back to our old episode on Tina. Um, when Nagini and uh, Credence first walk into the rally and she said, you know, these are pure bloods. They kill people like us for sport. Um, and Tina and Queenie are half bloods. Are they? So, yeah, we discussed oh, that right. in 420. Because well, both are their you, parents died of dragon uh-huh. pox, which only wizards get. Right. But right. so one of their parents must have been. Uh, exactly. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, so I wonder if. Grindelwald is just assuming she's a pure blood, and at some point it's going to come out that she's a half blood. And like at this point, I don't know that he's distinguishing that much. I don't know that he cares that much. But maybe his mania is just going to go, you know, to some level where only pure but pure bloods are the right kind of wizard, and everything else is beneath and is a beast of burden, not just muggles. Mm. So I wonder if that could come into play mm. at some point. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think I it goes that. back to um, if if that comes into effect, um, I have been listening to Ibram, Dr. Ibram Kendi's um, podcast, How to Be Anti-Racist, and they talk about like, even if like one of like, even if you're like an eighth black, you are considered black. Um, so I wonder if that would have any effect if it's like, if we're applying it to like the wizarding world if like even if like some distant relative is a muggle like you are like dirty blood you know Mm -hmm. yeah interesting yeah maybe i I think both of her parents dying of a disease that only real wizards can get should qualify her as like magical but we just don't know how it's gonna go to do with the grandparents too yeah Yeah. like harry potter is half blood but both of his parents were Mm -hmm. magic Mm what he did i think we talked enough about this next question and we know where ultimately it's going but the relationship between newt and tina um do we think it's gonna just kind of continue to be this very minor subplot because we well because we know they do end up together i don't think it's going to be so minor at some point in this film series I feel like it is going to get ramped up. And I feel like all bets are also off after the reception to movie two. Again, I think they're going to really, they're going to whittle down the number of characters. They're going to focus in on the core four. And because of that, there will be more time to develop Newt and Tina. Also, if we do have three movies, there's plenty of time to do that. So I don't really expect a ton of it all in one movie, but I definitely expect more so we can get to the point of their marriage by then and just to clarify when you say three you mean three more three more movies yeah okay yeah that yeah that made sense to me the whole thing about like their disagreement in this film i'd love it if the next film could just open up and there not have been some kind of major misunderstanding between films like let's just have their characters be at where they were at the end of movie two um, where they're getting along they're yeah, they can be snarky or banterous, but like they have declared their intention to date and they're enjoying each other's company, which is also where basically the first movie ended. Let's no more backtracking, like no more going backwards. Let's just let it because it, it works so well between the two of them. The actors do so well together. Let's just let Tina and Newt be together. It doesn't have to be major, like you're saying, I think, but let's just have them be actively in a relationship, whatever that means, right. um, do, or dating. Do you think the beasts come <laughs> to the wedding? I think the I think the Zuwu gives free piggyback rides to people. <laughs> I think the Niffler <laughs> carries the ring. Is he the ring bearer? Uh, yeah. Oh, the Niffler. The Niffler is absolutely the ring bearer. He'll steal the ring. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Okay, Frank. Frank the Thunderbird comes back from the first film and is the ring bearer and the officiant. <laughs> 
We don't know when they actually get married, right? No. no. But by the time of the Harry's school years, they're married and they have three measles, right? That's correct. Yeah. Not, Not kids. Measles. Measles. Well, Luna marries their grandson. Mm-hmm. So they have to have kids somewhere in between there. I would have to do the math. I, I can't do it off the top of no, my no, head. No, no, no. Ro- Rolf is a measle. <laughs> Luna married a measle? She would. <laughs> I was going to make the joke that like... If anybody would. I was going to make the joke. Credence spends movie two like looking for who he is or whatever. Maybe he never finds it. And then Newt and Tina just yeah. adopt him. And he's their kid. There you go. That's sweet. That'd be a night. That'd actually be a happy ending for Credence, considering every mm-hmm. other theory about what's going to happen to him. It's true. All right. Like One final question here. Um, you know, we we talked about how really um, catching Grindelwald was in large part due to her at the end of the first movie. Do we think that could potentially be foreshadowing of what's to come? We know ultimately, you know, Dumbledore needs to duel with him, but do we think she could potentially be the one to? kind of help bring him down. Uh, and uh, along those lines, I think I had this earlier up in the document, but I'll just add it here. We know that she's saved Credence multiple times. Is that also something we should be looking out for in future movies where Credence kind of pays her back for it? That's a great question. And again, I would have liked them to at least make eye contact in this film, but she talks to him when he's in his obscurial form and comes way closer than Newt to actually reasoning with him to getting him to calm down and stop destroying New York. So I think there is, there definitely must be a future there for those two characters, and I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I love that theory. In terms of bringing down Grindelwald, I can definitely see her involved in that at the least. You just look back at like, you know, Rowling has, I think Ro- there will be similar beats to Harry Potter. And you think of the Battle of the Ho- Battle of Hogwarts where everybody's getting involved. That's what you'll see by the end of Fantastic Beasts. Everybody's going to get yeah. involved. But she really is a very talented witch. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I do hope she gets one final something that helps bring him down. That would be really cool. You thought her jacket was big and heavy in movie two? Just wait till movie five. That's going to be 2,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that jacket will single-handedly kill Grindelwald. Its sheer weight oh. will defeat him. There you go. <laughs> it's going to be Hagrid's, by the way. They're going to take it out of retirement from the Potter films. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Hagrid is wearing Tina's jacket. <laughs> oh, that's no. going to be revealed. She's well, got Hagrid a could new be jacket in the film. every time, and then he just sews them all together and makes a big, giant jacket. <laughs> yeah, when Dump- when when Hagrid comes to Hogwarts, it'll be like an accommodation like he did for Lupin with the Whomping Willow. Hagrid will come to Hogwarts and he's like, well, I got no parents anymore. I don't have anybody to make me clothes. And Dumbledore's like, I think I have some old coats lying around in storage. Let me see if I can help you out. You're going to be my gamekeeper and I'll give you your coat. And he takes <laughs> Tina's old coats because she doesn't need them anymore. Uh, oh, and so- that's where Aragog comes from. The pocket of a stranger. The coat of a travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pocket of a stranger. There you go. Oh my Love gosh. It. Hey, y'all, Laura here, checking in to tell you about one of our sponsors, Third Love. I'm traveling right now, and it's been a long time since I've been able to get on a plane and get back to visiting the places I love. And I know from using them for the last couple of years that Third Love has my back through all of my travels with their high-quality underwear, sleep, and loungewear. And since their bras come in cup sizes double A through I and their sleepwear ranges from extra small to 3X, you can get ready to feel good in your perfect fit. Third Love obsesses over each stitch so you never have to think about how something feels, looks, or wears. While trends come and go, Third Love has always stayed true to one notion. We do comfort, you do you. And what better way to let you do you than their new seamless collection form? These are wireless bras and form-fitting undies with limitless stretch and endless comfort that disappears under your clothes. Third Love knows you deserve to feel comfortable and confident 24-7, so right now they're offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash mugglecast now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mugglecast for 20% off today. Well, how about a game segment to close out our Tina discussion for the time being? Let's do it. Game. All right. Your game. Ha ha ha. 
so the game that we're, we're calling, and I think this will probably be the only time we play it, but it'll be, I'm never going to say never on this. It's called Whose Eyes? And we know that Newt has told another human that they have eyes like a salamander and she does not immediately run away from him. So I figured it was fair game for uh, a game segment now because so many humans have so many eyes that are similar to non-humans. Here are a series of images we're going to look at. We're going to do one at a time and you guys tell me whether you think it's a human or a non-human based on the eye. I'm scared. Here's the first one. I think it's an animal. I think it's an animal as well. Really? Yeah. Oh, what? okay. Yeah, I think I can see that. So it's it's kind of like a yellow eye. It's got some, it, the eyebrow is kind of coming over the eye. The skin looks very pale. Is it Smeagol? But the pupil is so big in, or the, the iris and the, it's so big in the eye. You ever go to There's an eye no doctor white. and get dilated? Oh, yeah. <gasps> It's I terrible. just have this so wide <laughs> my contacts eyes. fall out. <laughs> well, because I could have Googled, like, for instance, I could have Googled human eyes that have been dilated by eye drops to confuse you. It all. looks like a horse's <laughs> eye to me. Wow. Well, that's a good guess. I'm going to go with my gut. I'm going to say human. Uh, Deanna and Katie say animal, I believe. And Micah? I'll say human. I'm going to go with you, Andrew. Okay, this is a rhesus monkey or a, a rhesus monkey. macaque. So it's wow. actually dun, real dun, close dun, dun, dun. ancestrally to humans, but okay. yeah, it's that was a little hard one to start off. Trickster, I see. Here's the next one. All right, this must be a an animal. Or this is me when I'm trying to fall asleep at night, but I can't. <laughs> all look like horse eyes to me. <laughs> Looks like a bird's eye. Again, there's no white yeah. around it. Okay, so we yeah, think birds are good uh, a good guess. Yeah. I'm thinking all, maybe some kind of reptile. But even. it's got the lashes. lashes. I don't bird. think the yeah. reptiles have Yeah. Lashes. Dark lashes, dark eye. And that pupil, it's not it's round. It's like a weird shape. shape. Yeah. 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 So let's say an- animal, right? We'll say yeah. animal. Okay, we all think animal. We all think non-human. This is a black rabbit. A rabbit. Oh, oh. Black rabbit. Here's the next one. I, I well, feel like world. I want that. I feel like that's a human eye. A human eye. Wow. I'm sure that's not a nebula. This, this one has like pits <laughs> and craters. I promise it's not a space photo. That's what I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> yeah. But actually, this is kind of what your eye doctor sees when they look under that giant like thing, like the human, like any of these eyes are can be that mm-hmm. detailed. OK, I'll say human, too. Sure. Okay. Uh, hold on. Okay. I'm still. Yeah, though, I'm looking it's at the, the lashes. Pits and valleys. It's the eyelid, too. OK, it's probably human. And you guys are right. This one is a human. OK. OK. Yeah. OK. Next one. Um. Jeez. Yeah. Human. Focus much? Yeah, Human really. from a uh, 1990s television talk show. I feel like it's a trick. I feel like <laughs> yeah, it looks really. human, but I feel Probably. like it's a trick. It is super zoomed in. It, it seems like more than the other ones, at least. It does have a lot of white on the outside, and I feel like animals don't have as so much white on that. Mm. Yeah. Or it could be a dog. That, or a horse. That, yeah, that black on the top. <laughs> That reminds me of the horse. It's the black on the oh, top. Oh, but... yeah. But do they look know. like salamander eyes? Because <laughs> this is an eye of Catherine Waterston herself. Huh? <gasps> what? what a twist. What a <laughs> twist. Uh, yeah, I I have to, in a mo- yeah, it's from a red, uh, one of like the highest res photos I could find. But uh, because no one took a photo of her eye for any reason, I still had to zoom in super much. And so. we're calling her a dog and a horse. <laughs> a oh, horse. my oh, gosh. Please don't. Well, look, it's not the greatest, clearest photo. But I'm this kidding. goes to prove that maybe there's something to human eyes looking like non-human characters. Yeah. There. Here's the final one. I have edited the corners of this to make it a little bit more obscure. Because, again, skin tone, eyelashes, things like that are very obvious tells yeah so just based on the eye what do you guys think about this final one the way you edited it it almost looks like one of voldemort's eyes or like a snake <laughs> eye um <laughs> how is it reflecting really it's like a window almost right or something it, it, it might be like, like laying on a eye. table or something it maybe. looks like my duck's eye is it an owl? A duck's eye. You have a duck? I have it does look duck. like a duck's eye. I have or six an ducks. Owl, maybe? That's cool. Oh, wow. I feel like Eric would include an owl here. And oh, this does look yeah. like an owl's eye to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm going to say 
this is Hedwig's eye after her death. Sorry. <laughs> Why does it? After her death? Yeah, because you see the light. Clearly, this owl is laying on a table. I'm sorry. A table? <laughs> An operating table. They were trying to save her. Then they were like, it- and then Eric came in and was like, wait, let me take a picture of Hedwig's eye. Okay. Or is it Nagini's eye? resuscitating her. Oh, it is so, so weird to see like a human structure, like a window reflected in the yeah. eye because this is not a human eye. So really? it's a domestic setting. Yeah, this is a lark, which is a, a small bird. Yeah, you're right about okay. birds. Cool. And that concludes our discussion on Tina. If you have any feedback, as always, you can email mugglecast at gmail.com or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also record a voice memo using your phone and send that to mugglecast at gmail.com. So it's time for Quizage. Last week's question, what is the name for the double agent working in the British Ministry of Magic as a bounty hunter who is secretly taking orders from Grindelwald? It came up in discussion last week. The correct answer was Gunnar Grimson. Oh, he's got a first name. Apparently. But uh, yeah, I think I it's wasn't just aware Grimson of for most of it. So uh, we actually... I had forgotten to update the question on the form itself, so we actually only got four entries. I think everybody else thought they were ahead or behind. So the correct winners for last week were Rob Tonks, Steve the Swedish Short Snout, Cassie Sanders, and somebody named Booba Tuber Puss. Okay. All right. You got to work Got to work on the names. Got to work on the names. I'll paint. Yeah, for right. Next week, please. They say they're lacking. I, I'm pleased for once. Um, <laughs> but anyway, next week's question. As of the late 20th century, Tina Goldstein lived with her husband, Newt Scamander, in Dorset with their pet, Neasles. What were their names? Submit that to us over at the MuggleCast website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich. And I'm updating the form right now with that question. Excellent. All right. Couple reminders here. Don't forget to join our community of MuggleCast fans today at Patreon.com slash MuggleCast. And you can get that special physical gift, one of the two or both depending on what level that you pledge at. You have between now and September 1st to become a patron and fill out that order form. Please fill out that order form. Otherwise, we cannot get you a gift. When you become a patron, you not only receive a physical gift, you will receive instant access to years of bonus MuggleCast installments, our exclusive Facebook group where fellow Harry Potter fans hang out with one another. You'll receive early access to each new episode of MuggleCast in an ad-free format. You'll receive a personalized video thank you message from one of the four of us. And you can get in line to one day become a co-host just like Deanna did today. Deanna, it was great having you on. Thank you very much. You did great. Added lots of feedback. So thank you. You're welcome. It was a blast. We would also appreciate if you made sure you're following MuggleCast in whatever app you use to listen to the show so you never miss an episode. If they have a review system, we would appreciate if you left a review to help new listeners learn about us. And by the way, we read all the reviews. We see them come in. Thank you, everyone, for leaving reviews. Everybody's very kind, leaving us a lot of stuff that makes us happy. So thank you very much for doing so. And finally, you can follow us on social media. We're MuggleCast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. All right, that does it for this week's episode. Katie, Deanna, thanks again for coming on. It was lovely having you both on. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. I'm Deanna. And I'm Katie. Bye, everyone. Bye. By the way, I'm going to have nightmares after seeing all those eyeballs. Bye.